Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're big, we're bad, we're back. I'm in black for another FAC Friday. So thanks ever so much for watching. If you haven't already, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't subscribed and you can hit the notifications bell. Also down below, please leave some questions for future FAC Fridays. And if you haven't already, check out producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. I will be recording a band in a professional studio using thousands of dollars of mics and hardware. It'll be a live session with all the musicians playing at the same time. They have an API 1608. I want to know how should I go prepared for my first recording in a professional studio? Should I record everything pure or use a compressor or EQ for some instruments? After the recording, I will mix it in my studio. I think by the very nature of you asking whether you should compress or EQ, I would say no. I would say no, because if you don't feel confident going into a situation, knowing exactly, you know, what kind of EQ or compression to use on certain instruments, I just wouldn't do any. You can always apply plugins on the session as it's being recorded if you want it to sound closer to what it could be on a playback. But as you've probably heard from many, many professionals that we've interviewed over the years, on Produce Like a Pro. Many people would, of course, the great Al Schmidt and the amazing Tommy Vaccari come to mind, two incredible engineers and mixers that have recorded big bands and orchestras. They always work on the principle of move the mic to the right place. So I would spend less time worrying about compression and EQ and more time about getting the microphone in the right place and by the sounds of it, because it's a live session, as much separation as you can. You are going to get instruments bleeding into each other unless they've got tons and tons of ISO booths and tons of great baffling. The reality is there will be some bleed and you can use that to your advantage. I think of Shelly Yakus, who actually loved that. He would record bands live at a lower level and baffle somewhat, but ultimately, his records had this feeling of a live performance. So I think it's a blessing. I think you're going to be in a situation where you've got a wonderful console, a 1608, which I absolutely love. I used on the second Frey record from almost the entire record. An amazing console. Although I will say you've only got 16 inputs. So when you're saying you're tracking a lot of musicians live, I'm assuming it's a four or five piece band. If it's going to be a bigger than that, then you might run out quite quickly. It really depends how many people are singing, you know, if there's extra players involved. But 1608 is an absolutely incredible console. I think if I was starting a uh, studio again, I could easily have a 1608 as a centerpiece for my studio and have all the drums and most of the tracks going through that. And then maybe a couple of external pre's, etc. But it's a beautiful, beautiful sounding console. I cannot overstate how good that console is. So you should have a wonderful time. Get in there, place the microphones in the best possible positions to get as, to reduce the amount of bleed so it's manageable. If you want to apply any EQ, maybe a little bit of high passing for instruments that you know don't need the low end bleed in them. Getting rid of low rumble out of a vocal mic, etc., is a smart thing to do. But ultimately, if you have any concerns whatsoever and you don't feel confident, then just do the compression and the EQ afterwards. I think it makes perfect sense. Capture big, fat tones, you know, and take it back to your studio and mix it. Just get that bleed down to a minimum. It's gonna be in there, but just get it down to a minimum. I find when I'm tracking live instruments, I'm leaning a little heavier on dynamic microphones that have better rejections. 57s start getting put in lots of different places. If I'm using a very beautiful vintage 47, it can be great if there's good baffling, but a 47 on a vocal mic with a band around it is pretty much a room mic as well as a vocal mic. What I would do is do a little bit of reconnaissance, find out about the studio, find out every detail about the musicians, what, what instruments they play, get the stage set up, figure it all out in advance, and you can pretty much plot where you're gonna put them, 
How are you going to baffle them off and even choose the microphones before you arrive? Preparation is the best thing in this situation. How can you make small home recordings sound like something recorded in a big room or an arena? Think modern worship, mega church kind of sound. That's not as difficult as you think. When you're in a big arena and you've got, you know, the artist coming off the stage, I mean, ultimately, you've got a blending of all of the instruments in one room. Meaning, if you really wanted that exact thing, you set up a reverb, a high quality reverb, and you send a blend of everything through it in varying degrees, and you'll get the sound of a band in a room. I have recorded a lot of live sessions. For instance, I recorded a live and burning by Black Veil Brides at the Wilton Theatre. And I had room mics at the Wilton Theatre from the soundboard capturing the audience and the sound of the room. And then, of course, I had the whole stage close mic'd. And when we came to mix it, it actually didn't sound as big as I wanted it to. So I took a blend of the whole band and fed it through a larger reverb and then blended it back. And then it started to feel like, wow, I was in the Wilton Theatre. Sometimes you have to exaggerate things to create that illusion because most modern recordings to a certain degree have reverb on so many different things. And the first mix I did from that Wilton Theatre was fairly accurate to what I heard in the room. When I sent it to the band, they were like, sounds good, doesn't sound big enough, doesn't sound like we were in a large venue. And the reality was, is the illusion when you're there and the feeling of being in this super crowded, you know, environment with thousands of kids jumping around and having a great time is not something that could be reproduced without visuals. Now, it did end up being a DVD and a Blu-ray, but the problem is, is the music didn't feel as big without that reverberation as the spectacle of it all. So, just got a stereo reverb and fed elements of the whole of the band through it, so it just sounded bigger. I didn't put as much bass in as you would imagine. I kept the bass out, maybe a tad. I didn't put as much kick in there. I already had some kick reverb, but the kick reverb had no low end on it. So the actual reverb that was there that I allowed to have some low end, I didn't feed any low end instruments into it. So it just felt big, added additional low end to things that didn't have it, but didn't create low end build up, excessive amounts of low end build up from a bass guitar and a kick. Blended it in, sent it back to the band, and they were happy. And that is the sound that you hear on that Blu-ray and that DVD. I've done tons of live stuff. I did the Ramones, I've done the Chili Peppers, Joe Strummer, tons and tons of live stuff. And we always play with it to make it a little bit bigger than it really sounds recorded because it's a live environment. And as I was saying earlier, I want to reiterate the feeling of being at a show with people jostling around and dancing and fighting for room and space and just having an amazing time. It's hard to translate into, you know, 10 mics on a stage and, a, and, and maybe some room mics. You have to exaggerate it a bit. So my answer to you is as clear as mud, as they say. Find a beautiful sounding, large arena sized reverb and send everything to it. Just be careful that you don't send too many excessive low end instruments to it. Maybe just a taste of kick, a taste of the bass, because you don't want a lot of low end build up because it's just not gonna sound good. That way, I think you can get something that sounds really special and really huge and will be exactly what you want. What are your thoughts on sounds that define a decade? Would you say songs today are going for a cleanest sound possible, meaning not much coloration with the use of samples and that decades before they were going for full mid-range and saturation? Where is music heading now? <laughs> That's like an absolutely massively huge question. The reality is, let's, let's be honest, is, is, is digital has allowed us to do whatever the heck we want. If you want to mimic exactly any genre, any time period, you can do it. The tools are there. You can go ahead and copy the feel and the groove and tempo map it and reproduce it and edit the schnizzle out of it, perform it, tune it, time it to whatever you want it to be. 
The creativity is all in your ears and in your, in the, in your abilities. So I don't know if I can say it's the music of the day. I know that's a popular thing and it will definitely get me more views if I say something really negative as a headline. And yeah, people will be like, yeah, Warren, you're right. I don't really believe that because I know musicians and I am a professional producer and engineer and a mixer and this is what I do for a living. So I get to work with, you know, 16 year olds and 60 year olds and above and everybody in between. I can tell you that musical level is, is, is as good as it's ever been. There's some phenomenal young players coming up and they love the music that we love. They love everything from Robert Johnson all the way through to the latest and greatest and everything in between. So it's a wonderful time. It's really up to us to really guide that. I think one of the difficulties is, and one of the mistakes that most YouTubers make, although I think it's deliberate because they're trying to you know, get high view counts, is to pretend that the that radio is still king and what happens on the radio or what the top 40 world charts on Spotify is, is king. If you're going to say that all of the poppiest of the pop is defining the music industry, then of course you can come to those conclusions and I understand it. However, there is tons of music being made that does well and generates income for tons and tons of artists that just isn't top 40. This is such a massive conversation. Because the bands I love, all of the bands I love, all of the artists I love were able to take the music of the time and morph it to their own ends. You hear me say it all the time, you hear me taking examples. I'm going to mention Queen. When Queen did the game in 1980, they had a disco song on it. Disco is big. Another one bites the dust. It's an absolutely massive song. I think on Spotify, it's like seven or 800 million plays. It's going to hit a billion in the not too distant future. So... That was a rock band morphing and doing something with a disco edge. I think the challenge is for us, if we're looking at it from a perspective of being, you know, rock musicians, whatever that means. It's like, you know what? Take the elements of a modern pop EDM track, take elements of it and morph it and use it to your own ends and create something really, really special and unique. I get a lot of people, you know, just talking about top 40 radio and complaining that there's no rock on there. And I always respond with, have you tried writing something that could cross over? Because every now and then a song crosses over, but not many people try it anymore. But to underline all of what we're just saying, the reality is, is like you don't have to care about pop radio. You do not have to care about it. You don't have to care about radio. I mean, rock radio doesn't sell any records at all. I don't remember what the band was, but I was talking to Bob Marlette a couple of years ago, and he had the number one modern rock song in the country about two years ago. And I think that week they sold hundreds of albums in the whole of the US. It's just not 1995 anymore, where you had a hit on K-Rock or WBCN, and that translated into selling two million albums. I mean, that's the sort of power that, that modern rock radio had. It's not like that anymore. So us worrying about radio formats is kind of irrelevant now. There's ways to make money. Um, there's ways to build fan bases. And all of those step outside of the traditional medium. So I get your question. I do not dispute what you're saying, but it is based on pop radio and the pop side of Spotify and the pop side of streaming. There are many, many artists that are making a living outside of that and many, many artists that are doing exceptionally well. An artist I did, I've done three albums with and a couple of EPs is Trevor Hall. Check out Trevor Hall. Literally Trevor, T-R-E-V-O-R -E Hall, H-A-L-L, -L, just in case you don't understand my accent, go and check him out. He's been independent now for a couple of albums. I think the last time I looked, he was getting about one, one and a half million monthly listeners for an independent artist. We have a song that we did together off an album called Chapter of the Forest, which the last time I checked, it was about 36 or 37 million plays on one song. It's just on one song. The whole album is probably in the hundreds of millions of plays. And I know he's doing well from it. And that is an incredibly talented artist. It's completely 
and Utterly Organic. The two albums that I did, Chaps of the Forest and Carla, the other ones were actually EPs. Um, Unpack Your Memories was an EP. But those two albums are almost entirely organic. Live acoustic guitar, me playing some electric, stand-up bass, him playing some drums, loads of vocals, no auto-tune, kungas, djembe, bongos, like all organic music that has millions of plays and that actually he sells physical copies of. He sells CDs, he sells vinyl, and he's making a great living because he's incredibly talented. And it's all outside of mainstream radio. It's all, So I, I know that this exists. I know that artists can do well. If they've got something really super unique like he does and other artists have, they exist outside of it. So go and check him out, Trevor Hall, Check out um, Carla, Chapter of the Forest. Very, very proud of Chapter of the Forest. I get asked all the time, one of the albums I'm most proud of, everybody expects me to say Frey or Aerosmith or James Blunt or, you know, they expect me to go with like really big artists. And those are all fantastic artists, don't get me wrong. But I always say Chapter of the Forest, Trevor Hall, because we did it here in the studio and we just moved a couple of mics around and recorded a bunch of great stuff. And the songs were fantastic and the performances were great. So... To answer your question, go back to that. I know that there's plenty of music that is outside of the stereotypes. I, I don't disagree with you, but that's only from a perspective of modern pop radio and Spotify's like top 100. Plenty of artists, plenty of artists do really, really well outside of that. And if we just want to focus on that small little echelon of popness, I get it. I understand your point. But don't be disillusioned. You can make great music. You can be true to yourself. And if your art is that good, you can be successful. Trevor proves it and many other artists prove it. Thank you ever so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. It's a blessing to be able to do this. Please leave a whole bunch of comments and questions below. Go check out Phil Allen's free course. You can download a free course from two days ago. There will be a link down below. Go check out that video now if you haven't already. And you can download the multi-tracks and watch the course for free. Mm -hmm.